why don't you start off by giving us a little background on yourself and for those who aren't familiar with the kind of work you do. Sure. Um, my name is Alexis Boylan. I am a uh, associate professor in the art and art history department and also a joint appointment in Africana studies. Um, what that means is that I focus um, in my teaching and in my scholarship on uh, images, um, the visual culture of how we uh, uh, represent race, how we think about race visually, um, and also gender um, and sexuality as well. Um, my particular focus then is on uh, art that has been produced or made or brought to the United States, um, basically from uh, tend to start around like 1600 and go up to like yesterday. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the sort of the, the wide spans of things that have been going on um, in this sort of uh, pre-nation and then nation. Um, uh, and I am also the um, uh, current acting director um, for this semester and then also the director of, typically the director of academic affairs at UConn's Humanities Institute. Um, so uh, that's sort of like my professional spiel. Um, we're talking today, I realized I, sh I should have grabbed a copy of the book so I could sort of like, you know, show you the actual book. But um, I am- I can probably uh, put in a- um... A oh, of like a, yeah, actually, I think I have some, I can get you some good images. They, they, it's, um, anyway, I am the author of, uh, uh, and, I, and why we're talking today is, uh, my new book is out called Visual Culture. It's um, uh, from MIT, and it's part of their Essential Knowledge series, which is uh, books that are focused on um, uh, very complex issues, but then are produced to really speak to a general audience, and they're beautifully designed and um, uh, meant to be really readable. Um, uh, so really sort of straddling, you know, complicated subjects, but for a general audience, for a general readership. Um, I am also the author um, of uh, the book Ashcan Art, Whiteness and the Unspectacular Man. Um, uh, I also co-authored a book, um, which was very fun with four people, um, uh, about uh, the movie Mad Max Fury Road called Furious Feminisms. Um, and then later this year, I actually have another book coming out that I edited um, that was based on the exhibition that I did at UConn um, about Ellen Emmett Rand, who was a 20th century portrait painter. And um, uh, UConn is fortunate to have a bunch of her paintings and her papers. So um, yeah, it's been a, I started off the year with Mad Max and then visual culture and I'll end with uh, uh, formal portraits. So um, uh, it's been a big year. <laughs> yeah, you keep very, very busy. Um, yeah, it's funny, you know, it's just, it, the publishing world is just like, you know, things, things stack up and that sort of thing. Um, but it's all been very, very fun. Uh, uh, good projects. I was lucky. Excellent. And I, it's funny you say the, the book is meant to be readable. I did find it very readable as someone oh, who isn't into, um, you know, I read a lot of fiction these days, especially with the pandemic, but when I was reading your book, it just surprised me. I was gearing myself up for something that was going to be, um, very academic tone and right. it was just it was interesting as heck so I really enjoyed it oh that's great to hear that actually makes me really happy um uh you know I sort of I I tried to imagine um uh, as I said they're beautifully designed books they they just have these very they're all they're they're smaller than average books um uh, in just in literally size and they actually they sort of fold very beautifully and they just they have this really nice they feel good to read um, because I think it's also just encouraging us to, to think about things we might not normally think about, but that we're sort of interested in or that we've heard something about and want to know more about. Um, I mean, I think it's an increasingly, uh, I think there's a tension in academia about sort of what are we doing? Who are we speaking to? You know, um, you know, complex ideas sometimes need complicated language and they need sort of, um, you know, like a specialist's vocabulary. But sometimes it's good to sort of back up and think about bringing a lot more people into the conversation. So that's really what I wanted to do with this book too. I mean, I think visual culture is, I think, the most important um, uh, uh, vocabulary uh, that we have in this current moment. So I think that it's more urgent than ever for more people to be thinking critically about visual culture. So no, I, I agree, especially, you know, even in my line of work where I work with marketing communications and publicity, and a, a big piece of that is always social media. So 
Yeah. The idea that something can be so image driven or a campaign, for example, can be entirely based on the images and the videos that you put out to support it. It's, um, it's very much in line with a lot of the content in this book. So, yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, technology has done an enormous amount of things to how we, I mean, first of all, we just also are sort of forced to see all kinds of images all day that we don't choose to see. Mm -hmm. um, have so much less control over our visual culture, but at the same time, in many ways, technology gives us a lot more access to it. Right. Um, but then there's also this pressure to be visible. Um, you know, I think, it, it, you know, like, uh, to, to sort of get your, your product, um, even if that's you or if that's your creativity sort of out there in a way that's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a new pressure. I mean, you know, capitalism, uh, uh and certainly neo-capitalism has been moving in this direction, but the technology has amped it up tremendously. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, why don't you talk a little bit about where you first found inspiration for this book? Yeah, no, um, uh, it's funny. So I didn't, I, I will say I did not find inspiration for the book in the sort of traditional, I wish I had like a story of like, I've wanted my whole life to, you know, <laughs> write this book, but, um, you know, but I think, I think inspiration can sometimes be a little bit over, over, um, uh, overvalued. Um, uh, uh, the editor of the book, um, Victoria Henley, um, came to me and said, I think you'd be great to write this book. And um, I was like, no, no, that's not really what I do. And you know, like that's, that's, that's for somebody else. And she was like, yeah, you're wrong. And read some of the Essential Knowledge series and think about it. And um, so what I wanna say is that she was inspired because I didn't see um, myself writing this book, but she did. And then as soon as I read a bunch of the, of the series, um, and then also, uh, uh, I think sort of when, when I started to think about what I wanted to say and what I could maybe contribute, um, to a sort of a broader audience, I became really, in, I, then I became really inspired. Um, then I became very excited about the potential um, to, to work on this book, to, to write something really different than, than some of the other books I had worked on. I mean, I think working at the Humanities Institute has also really inspired me to think differently about what academics and professors can do um, in, in, in terms of our voice. Um, uh, you know, I think that I have become more interested in activism about the arts and humanities. And so um, uh, I think my editor was inspired to come to me and then she sort of got me very excited about the potential of a book like this to really speak to the, this historical moment. And I think some of the ways in which we all struggle with visual culture and what to let in and what we are not seeing, what's kept away from us visually. Um, so, uh, and those were all some of the issues I really then came to feel very passionately about wanting to write. So it was a sort of a twisted tale of inspiration. Sure, sure. No, it makes a lot of sense though. Um, so when you were asked to write the book, how did your research or your work as a professor um, play a role in how you assembled your theories or assembled the structure of the book? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, um, I actually really did sort of approach it I think when you teach, first of all, teaching is a constant surprise. Things I think that the students will really enjoy, they often are like, oh no, I hate that. And then things that I'm like, oh, this is super boring. They're like, stop, I need more <laughs> on that. Like I don't, you know, so I think it's always really, um, the classroom is just a really, um, it's an important space for me because I also think that it really, it helps me also remind myself of my own process of coming to images and what I let in and what I feel anxious about. But I think one of the things, and I think certainly everybody who teaches visual culture or art history and, and has, has, has dealt with this is students who just sort of, they freeze up, um, they, they sort of, it, they freeze up and shut down when they see an image that they just they're like i don't know what i'm supposed to do like they get a real sort of performance anxiety around certain images um 
And that then at the same time, there's other images that they're all like, oh yeah, I totally know what that means. I get it. I don't even have to look at it. I know what it is. And I'm interested in the classroom in both of those moments because I'm interested in them thinking about why did you just shut down? What just happened? Why do you think that you, you know, it often happens, for example, around like abstract works, mm -hmm. but it can also happen around works that are very old or things that have a lot of detail in them. And the students just sometimes freeze up. And I think everybody does this. So, I mean, I get this in the classroom a lot, but I've actually, ha I mean, I've had this experience. This happens to me too, mm -hmm. where I just stand in front of something and I'm like, I, it's not for me. It's not for me. I have no access in. And that's about a lot of other voices in our heads, um, telling us that we're not smart enough, telling us that that's not for people like us, um, telling us that we can't, that that's for elites, or that's for um, working class people, or that's for professors, or that's for, you know, that, that there's a lot of mechanisms in our world that encourage us to imagine that, that, that we don't have the right to certain things. Um, and so I do feel like that one of my jobs and what inspired me in the classroom and that I want a lesson that I wanted to take was like, think about why you have that reaction and think about who wants you to have that reaction. Who doesn't want you to see this? What are you being blocked off from um, uh, in that moment um, that could potentially give you joy or give you sorrow or give you knowledge or give you, you know, give you all kinds of things. Um, so I think that was sort of one of the things that I was really interested in that, and that the classroom really and my teaching really helps sort of provoke. The other thing was is that how often students, and I do the same thing, is that I look at something and I look at it very quickly and it has all the codes of something that I think I know. So I don't really look at it. I don't really think about it. I just let it in. And I don't stop and say, hold on, what message is that really sending? Do I really want to, to look at that? Does that actually kind of have a message in it that I, I don't, that doesn't gel with my ideas about social justice or myself or the world that I want to live in? So I think also stopping students from passively just accepting the world as if it's not been manufactured, edited, manipulated, um, uh, I think is also part of what inspired me, what I, the work that I do in the classroom that inspired me in terms of this book, that those were the two things that I really, I want to, I, I want to empower myself and I want to empower other people to take visual culture more seriously and to just to be like um, a little bit radicalized and thinking about seeing as a radical and um, empowering activity. Absolutely. It um, kind of reminded me of that book, Ways of Seeing, and I'm blanking on the author. Yes, John Berger. John Berger. Yeah, Berger. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so he is, um, I, I, I mean, I will say I read that book when I was an undergraduate and it was revelatory. Same. Um, yeah, no, and, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a magnificent and beautiful book about, you, the, the punchline is you matter. What you see matters and your decisions to see things and how they see things matter. And so I think, absolutely, I think that's a message that um, I think anybody who works on and is devoted to visual culture is committed to, um, uh, you know, and, and I think more than ever, that has a real urgency to it. Absolutely. Um, so segueing into the book itself, your first chapter, sorry, we have a puppy over here. If he jingles every once in a while, that's all it is. Um, your first chapter dissects the what of visual culture, what it is, what its limits are, and unwraps the information as a sense of yearning or wanting. And it seems like that's something that plays out really literally in social media and capitalism, but you remind readers that human wanting is old and that it's the only stable constant across space and time. And that part of the first chapter really was when I was like, okay, this is a great book. Um, <laughs> can you kind of unbox that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I wanted in that first chapter to get at, uh, first of all, I mean, I think that it's very tricky to talk about universals. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really like universals. I don't think that they really apply. I don't really think it's a helpful way 
of approaching sort of thinking about experiences. I think that, you know, um, our bodies, our historical period, all sort of affects how we, how we move through and conceptualize our world. Um, but I do think that we want, um, when we're hungry, we want to eat, when we're thirsty, um, I think we want things from other people. We want things from our lives. Um, and that uh, it is maybe easier to think about visual culture, um, particularly if you feel um, insecure, like, well, what did you want from this? What could an image do for you? Could it get you from A to B? Could it make you happy? Could it make you sad? Um, uh, you know, I think we are silly to underestimate how much we want from our visual culture. And I don't mean silly and then like, a, you know, a, 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 or even, I think it's not even careless. It's just, I think we miss an opportunity when we don't admit to ourselves that we want things and that other people want things and that many times what we want is a profound connection. We want to also mark that we were here, that we mattered, um, that our ideas mattered, that our, the people we loved mattered. Um, and, and that, I think, is also a way that opens up more visual culture to us instead of being like, I don't recognize that, I don't know what that is, I'm shutting down, is to actually approach it and say, well, what does the image want? And what do I want from the image? Um, and sort of then play around with that. It just, it felt a little bit to me like that was a, a productive way to get into the conversation about visual culture. That was less about who you are and more about what you want um, and what you want from visual culture. I mean, I think sometimes people just want visual things to please them. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, no, you have to deep thoughts. Um, it needs you know, to be more meaning. Yeah, no, you have to sit and stare at it and puzzle it and, and that sort of thing. But I think, um, uh, uh, I, first of all, I don't believe that even people who want something that is deep and puzzling, that that doesn't give them pleasure. So again, it's sort of like, well, just because that gives one person pleasure doesn't mean we should be dissuaded from appreciating or if trying to figure out why this other kind of image gives this person pleasure. I also think that we have to appreciate pleasure because that's also how people who produce images control us. Um, uh, and that often what might seem pleasurable is often about manipulating power and then can be used to create incredible divisions, incredible sadness, social injustice, that sort of thing. So I think that it's important to think about pleasure because it's important to think about wanting because so much um, that is both very, very good and very, very potentially devastating about visual culture hinges on really thinking about what do you want? Why do you want that? What, what, what does it mean to want that? Excellent. Um, I, just for the sake of time, I think I'm gonna skip ahead to one of the other questions I had, um, which was when you wrote about the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden and right. installation by Sam Durant in 2017, which led to protests and the sculpture was dismantled and given to the Dakota tribe. Um, and then you wrote that while some populations view art as a designation of respect to value or honor, for others, this designation is nothing more than another oppressive idea, part of the larger power dynamics of colonialism, cultural genocide, and disrespect, um, which just seems like such a timely thing to talk about right now, always, but especially right now, and especially while this is the kind of news that we are just seeing so much of. Um, can you speak? a little bit more to that story and how it fits its way into your book? Yeah, I mean, I think that even before the pandemic, although the pandemic has certainly increased both the pressure on museum spaces um, uh, and also on museum spaces to speak more powerfully to the diversity of audiences that they um, uh, uh, claim to uh, uh, speak for. Um, I think there has been a large sort of shift around the word art. 
um, who, uh, so first of all, like art is um, a category. And it's a category that is very much about um, uh, defining what is inside this category and what is outside this category. And um, so it has been a great honor for some things to be deemed worthy of being art. But at the same time, um, uh, that is an entire system. Art is an entire construct which is based on exclusion, on saying that some things are not worthy, some things are not important to see. Um, and I think it's always important to remember sort of objects that were made for one purpose and then get somehow reimagined and reappropriated and put in museums and presented as art. Um, and I think what's been really exciting, I, I think that the example, the Sam Durant um, uh, example that I used about Minneapolis was a sort of uh, a beginning um, of, I think, a really aggressive and I think really empowering and important move to really start putting pressure on museums, not just sort of in theory or not just in academic journals, but to say, yeah, exactly. But to say like, no, you, you actually, you don't get to just make all the decisions about what is seen. And you don't get to speak for people who you didn't even bother to consult. Um, and again, I think that, you know, um, uh, as a white artist, as a, as a male artist, I think he also was um, uh, uh, involved in a lot of dialogues that he didn't take the time to work through. Um, and that was the other reason I wanted to focus on that work because I think in some ways um, it, it seemed, it seemed like a very progressive, very radical, very like to, you know, a very woke to use that phrase. Um, you know, he was dealing with issues of systematic genocide, racism in the United States, but the way in which then it got collapsed, the way in which um, indigenous peoples again were silenced and made invisible, um, and equated, again, the sort of, um, the, you know, that we cannot equate simply all non-white experiences as just being the same. Um, uh, I think was a really, it was a helpful example, I thought, of being able to, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, each chapter of the book begins with a provocation. And so, and I really meant that, like I wanted to provoke the reader to have to think through these messy, complicated issues and also then hear all the voices so you know i have quotes from sam durant i have quotes from the curator and i have quotes from the protesters because i think that you know um it, it's important that and again each person and reading the provocation maybe not knowing a hundred percent where like should the piece have been taken down? Should it have been, you know, who, what, could there have been a different process? If the process had been different, would the result have been different? I think it allows the reader to do a little bit of their own thinking through the issues. Um, and so that's sort of why I wanted to use that example, but also like how each chapter begins with that kind of question about how an image um, or an incident occurs where the image is supposed to have one meaning and then it changes, it shifts um, to become something else. I think that's part of what made it so readable and engaging is that um, sort of framework, just from a writing standpoint, it makes it digestible and just difficult to put down. So um, I'm, oh, great to hear. Yeah. This time. I'm so glad you took the time to chat. This has been really wonderful. Um, but for anyone who's interested in picking up a copy of the book, is there a specific place where they should go find it? Or um... Um, MIT Press. Um, it's part of the Essential Knowledge series. It's also on Amazon. Um, but I would just say, particularly in this moment, um, if we can all go to independent bookstores and university presses directly, um, it just allows those people and those um, teams to uh, reap some of the rewards. Um, uh, and uh, again, in this moment, um, it's particularly sort of, uh, it would be great if people want to find the book there. Um, uh, yeah, and there's also, and I, I think um, uh, maybe we could attach a link to it, but there's actually a sample um, uh, from Lit Hub um, about a, a little piece of the book I wrote about Beyonce and um, uh, her video um, with Jay-Z in the loop. So um, uh, people can get sort of a little, a little bite there. Um, Perfect. Well. Yeah, I'll definitely include that. Awesome. 
thanks so much. This was really fun. It was great to talk with you. And thank you for your enthusiasm for the book. So, oh, my yeah. pleasure. <laughs> you did the hard work. <laughs> my, my flight is easy. Great. Well, thanks again. And uh, yeah, uh, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.